So are Christians really aliens? Boss, look, an alien! Where? Okay, okay, you got me. And not the little gray aliens that come down from outer space with UFOs, but like aliens from another country. We see this painted throughout all scriptures that as Christians, as people of God, we are just passing through this life on our way to eternity with Him. And this is the hardest part. What are we supposed to do while we're here? And certainly it's not just chilling out until we go home to be with Jesus. Well, stick with me today and I'll show you how to live in this world and not be of it. On Church Door. This year marks the 51st year that a group of pilgrims have made their journey up to the top of the cliffs of Holdstone Downs in the UK. They believe Jesus made his first visit there from Venus. And they go there each year to charge these special batteries with prayer. Almighty God, who is the creator of all things. Bruh. Seriously, it exists. It's a group called the Aetherius Society. They were founded by a man named George King in the 1950s. And although he's dead, they still practice this weird warped religion that borrows from Christianity. Now, as crazy as this seems, I can see how some people get sucked into this lunacy. There is a desire in so many people. They wanna feel as if they have a special mission, that they're connected to something beyond the average everyday and mundane experience. Scotty, beat me up. But here's the thing, it's not gonna be revealed through some sci-fi aficionado who wants you to believe that he got a special message from Master Jesus of Venus. Actually, right before Jesus was crucified, he prayed for you. Yes, you, people who would come to believe and follow Christ after his death. In John 17, it says this at verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus has sent us on a mission, and our mission is to share the truth of the gospel with other people so that they may believe and continue sharing the freedom, forgiveness, and reconciliation with God that is found through Jesus Christ. Now, often where this falls so flat for many is that the call isn't glamorous. Actually, earlier on in this prayer, Jesus said this, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. Why? Because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. I do not ask you to take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. So sanctify them in truth and your word is truth. As you have sent them into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. Jesus paints this picture for all of his followers, which is in tension with this world. Yet he doesn't pray for them to be taken from it, but ultimately he prays that they can endure despite its hardships. That's why I'm going to name this message, how to live in this world and not be of it. In this prayer, Jesus says those of us who follow him must be different. You're weird, buddy. You're weird. And if that is so, how are we to be different? Jesus says that this is by the word, which is truth. What does he mean when he says the word? Well, the writer of this very gospel, John starts by saying at the very first, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. A few verses later, then continues and says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So who is the word? It's Jesus. In other words, what is being said in Jesus's prayer is that we are set apart because we know him. Jesus is God in the flesh. Come to earth to show us our way back to the father. So if you want to know how to live in this world and not be of it, live like Jesus lived. Now, I know this has become cliche in Christian circles. The WWJD bracelets made everyone keenly aware of our need to live through the lens of what Jesus does. But 
truth be known, our idea of how this fleshes out day to day is all over the place. There's a classic book by H. Richard Niebuhr called Christ and Culture. And in that book, Niebuhr outlines five common Christian points of view about how different Christians have articulated what it looks like when we live out Christ in our culture. His first thought is Christ against culture. This often manifests itself in separatism. I gotta get out of here! The idea being that in order to not be tainted by the world, we must be away from its influence. The second idea he talks about is Christ of culture. Here Christians see culture as being in harmony with Jesus. That the good things we see are a reflection of Christ's goodness, usually through the form of human achievement. Then he also shares Christ above culture. This is more like having your head in the clouds. Not that culture is ignored, but the highest value is bestowed divinely from above, trumping our human understanding. There is also Christ and culture in paradox. This idea kind of stems from the thought that we live in a duality as part of a spiritual kingdom, but also in the fleshly fallen world. Therefore, as Christians, we are called to engage both. And finally, there's Christ, the transformer of culture. This is the idea that Christians should actively engage and reform the culture towards the values of God's kingdom. Now, which of these do you think is biblically accurate? None? All? Maybe a few of them? Well, for me, I think there are ways to justify these scripturally, some better than others, yet none of them are perfect. And it seems to me that there is a lot of room overlapping in these when it comes to practical practice. But I want to propose something simpler, something that I actually think encompasses the vast majority of how Jesus modeled his kingdom during his life here on earth. And that's the three C's of Christ in culture. Those would be the great command, the great commission, and the great compassion. Now the great command, most of us know, it's to love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then when we do that, all of God's law is fulfilled. The great commission was Jesus's mic drop before he ascended to heaven, telling his disciples to go to all the nations and make more disciples. Then there's this one that maybe you haven't heard of before, what I call the great compassion. The first two, the command and the commission, are kind of like the what, but ultimately behind every what, there needs to be a why, the heartbeat behind why Jesus has done what he's done. And the Bible makes it clear just why Jesus came to this earth. It was to seek and save that which is lost. The Bible tells us that when Jesus saw us, he had compassion on us because it looked as if we were sheep without a savior. And that includes you. If you haven't found freedom from Jesus Christ, Jesus came for you. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we have people here that want to walk you through it. You can reach us down in the chat box or you can text prayer to the number that you see coming up on the screen right now. Help us spread this as great Christian content. Hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so that every time we put out a piece of content, it's going to come directly to you. Or you can go the extra mile. Go to rivervalleyrockford.org slash give and make a donation there. Every cent that comes in goes right back out to help people just like you taking their next step with Jesus. Hey, let's keep hanging out. I got another video for you. Go ahead and hit that button right in the center of the screen.